All right, once again, I, uh, this is going to be the, what is this? The January PU monthly report. And I was told that last time I kind of skipped through things a lot because it was very old stuff in that report. This should be more, a lot more new stuff. So I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail. If you want the like abridged short version, just wait till we can review and we'll, we'll do it that way. Um, but yeah. Let's check out the January monthly report. For me, these are the only places in Star Citizen where you can actually see who's working on what and what kind of progress they made. Progress tracker, no bueno. ISC is all road to 4.0 garbage. Sneak peek, same thing. This is the only thing that they put out there that is like a legitimate progress report of what's going on with the game. So, and they always start out with AI features. Uh, maybe I'll shrink it a little bit and try. I don't know. That makes it so tiny. I'll make it. Oh, that's better. That's probably perfect where I'm, I can shrink myself a little bit. Hold up. And then I'll be out of the frame for you guys. Perfect. Just like that. Nice. All right. So AI features is usually one of the, the more interesting things, except it's one of the things that we never really see because the AI sucks so bad in the game. But AI features uh, started the, the year enabling AI characters to throw grenades. So that could get interesting, especially at some of the like outposts and stuff. It involved work in mul multiple areas, including new logic for when to throw them to ensure a challenge without overwhelming the player. Uh, this definitely seems something for Squadron 42. Uh, January also saw the implementation of attack and defend areas, which can be assigned to AI characters to direct and control fighting in specific ways. Uh, I will still skip around a bit. You know, that just gives kind of detail to those things. But again, I don't see to see much uh, in the PU in regards to this. I, I love when they call this a uh, a PU report when this is all for Squadron, you know. It may come to the PU, but it, it, it won't, I don't think. The attack area is great for building pressure on the player, whereas the defend area can provide the player with a tough challenge as the AI are hunkered down and ready to fight. The implementation of this feature involved reusing existing systems in new ways, changing the tactical queries uh, to take into consideration the attack or defend area that the AI might have. Could really make great missions, you know, to like do stuff like this. But I just don't know if it'll work, right? AI tech uh, again, we heard a lot about NPCs driving in ground vehicles. Last month, they fixed several related bugs as more designers began using the feature. If this is a pre-PU report, it it really feels like maybe in 319, we might see these guys drive around, but I, I don't know. They also progress with the feature that enables NPCs to use transit systems like elevators and move between platforms. This time, they focus on NPCs using trains to move between locations. This required exposing new functionality on the transit manager and more complex behaviors before and during transit. This is pretty crazy. Uh, I imagine this is going to be something that's useful as well for um, possibly the loading and unloading of your ship, right? Uh, locomotion, I usually don't focus on. Uh, just, it's like animation stuff. Subsumption Apollo tool. Subsumption is supposed to be the tool that makes the AI feel alive. Right? And here, I'll pin that for you. One second. Just letting chat know that there's no uh, alerts at the moment. Um, yeah, the subsumption tool is what's supposed to make the AI like have a life, like a 24-hour day cycle. And yeah, I don't think we expect that anytime soon. Usually when I see that, I sort of 
ignore it, but some subsumption is also the the whole system that has the AI do anything. So this could mean anything, uh, but it's just like more of game dev speak. Uh, usable coordinator sounds a lot like that. Uh, feature that allows NPCs to perceive threats through audio and visual stimuli and react to hostile vehicles was completed. This is a big one, especially hostile vehicles, because we, we saw in previous monthly reports, they're now able to use rail guns and missile launchers and things like that. This allows them to know where they are and react to them and possibly fire. AI Tech started working on two new features, one that allows overrides for navigation mesh generation so that the team can create navigation meshes for specific agents in narrow areas. For example, this will enable NPCs to reverse areas where only a crouch state is possible, such as vents and underfloor areas. That's kind of cool. Um, again, more stuff that can just open up mission gameplay. It's just a matter of when and, and even if the mission teams are able to make good missions, Will the NPCs even do what they told them to, you know? So we'll have to see. Um, AI vehicle features. All right, here we go. So focus on space combat AI improvements. In January, the intent is to have combat AI behave more in a dynamic way that encourages players to move and explore the various ship mechanics. This involved breaking the AI into different well-defined trees, which will help players to identify what kind of enemies they're up against. These improvements also allow the easier integration of more maneuvers to further increase the skill level and interest of higher level ships. We have been hearing this since Arena Commander 1.0. Anytime I read this, I immediately ignore it. I have not, like, the AI sometimes feel better, stronger, and, like, more difficult, but I never got a feel for these kind of, like, behaviors yet, and they've been working on them forever. Uh... AI vehicle features worked on a new behavior logic to deliver improved atmospheric flight combat. This is intended to work with the control service feature being developed by the vehicle feature team and will lead to AI ships tailing and chasing players to get behind them flying more like a plane when appropriate. Believe it when I see it. Animation team is always facial animations because they're not working on the PU. It's squadron. But then they'll put the female vendor in there and be like, see? <sighs> Art characters, uh, production of the Frontier Environment Wear. This is for uh, Road to 4.0 stuff. Duster Faction, Rough and Ready Gang, and always just the casual mention of Fauna every month for the last few months. We'll see what that ends up leading into. Ships. Everybody loves ships. Uh, the UK, our team, continued to work on the small ship mentioned in last month's report, with certain elements reaching LOD0 complete. They also began exploring ideas for a variant. The small ship. Okay. Argo SRV progressed through final art. Final polish is currently underway on the exterior before LOD and damage passes begin. The interior continued through final art and received an LOD pass. Wow. Okay. That's kind of big. So I think we'll be seeing a lot of the SRV in uh, in re future ISCs, I should say. But that still means they have a little bit of time because they. I think uh, after this, they go to like damage and things like that. Um, final art or fart for short. We should call it that from now on. Development of the Crusader Spirit continued, which passed, passed its white box review with the A1 variant moving into the gray box phase. All right. So I was kind of skeptical about the A A one series ships a1 c1 and e1 um specifically because we've seen other ships do this kind of like go into gray box phase and then be ignored for a long time and it kind of felt like it would make sense for the spirit to go through that as uh, it was a concept ship. It's There's a lot of other ships that should be worked on, and uh, I don't think anybody really understands why this one's being prioritized over other ships uh, that are not finished. The kind of age-old ridiculousness that has been going on for some time with uh, what ships get prioritized and what doesn't, and it's very hard for us to understand. 
Um, they're just saying the, the exterior is shaping up nicely with key forms all established and major elements like landing gear, VTOLs, all that. Uh, previously unannounced ground vehicle passed its gray box sanity review before art work progressed on LOD zero. The exterior is almost finalized, only requiring additional detail while the interior is progressing well. So another ground vehicle in a situation where ground vehicles still don't have a lot of purpose gameplay, uh, but they keep building them out. And uh, this is one of, again, one of my like biggest pet peeves and the things that frustrate me the most about Star Citizen is they're designing a bunch of uh, ver like the key hero things, which are the vehicles, before there's any gameplay design to inform them. And then they always have to go back and redo them. It drives me nuts, man. It just feel it just makes no sense to me. Bombing ships without any bombing missions, <laughs> right? It's it's ground vehicles without any roads. Just a weird thing. I think the the best example of where they did it well was with the Atlas platform stuff because it they took the the gameplay at jump town and informed a an entire lineup of vehicles that are useful in a location like that the other ones i don't know it's just kind of weird is it just racing or what um us team completed art white box for another in production vehicle which was then passed to the systems design team uh, Greybox began on another ship. Half the team focused on the main fuselage geometry, while the other prototyped a new way to enter and exit the ship. Finally, for ships, an all-new vehicle entered Greybox, and a new set of alien paints was created for a future release. Okay. A lot of unannounced ships, with a lot of ships that have been announced yet to be done. Uh, I always skip community because it's just marketing. Uh, but they have a new community manager in the LA office that's bilingual. And we're excited to introduce them soon. Nice. Uh, engine, I don't know a lot of what's going on here. So renderer, Gen 12, they mentioned Gen 12. Uh, did op optimizations based on the telemetry data from 318. Um, additionally, render initialization was factored to prepare for Vulcans. So now they're moving on to that. On the core engine, further improvements were made to for the remote shader compiler. Okay. Again, I'm not the guy to go to for this information. Uh, here we go. Features. Arena Commander. Throughout January, the team and the one of the guys who we'll see on ISC today is here. Uh, DJ Button. He works on the Arena Commander feature team. So he probably wrote this up. Throughout January, the team focused on polishing the new Arena Commander front end and racing tracks, including placing the New Horizon Speedway tracks above a new planet, Green 3 of the Ellis system. Some adjustments were made to the racetracks themselves to suit the new Earth-like atmosphere. The team also experimented with the new loadout selection previews on the front end alongside polishing its style and flow. The Ellis system is where the current arena commander racetracks are correct that's where the um the murray cup is so it's not like it's not like they've been working on the ls system in the back top round the entire time for squadron 42 it's where they're meant to be okay so they they have some like assets that they've had maybe for a while I'm just curious, like, is there this Ellis system being worked on and we never knew about it? Uh, work continued on the classic race refactor with the first version of the new race manager and checkpoint setups being tested and feedback address. Optimizations and additions such as splits, qualifying, qualifying, and new analytic data were made alongside improvements to time accuracy. Wow, this sounds like it's going in more depth than I would have expected it to. Uh, refactors have built the rounds and spawning modules continued across Arena Commander and Star Marine. This refactor sees the code drastically improved and brought up to the current standards while providing more modularity for new features. It also tackles some of the problem areas that prevented the expansion of the old systems, such as separating the unintended connections uh, to the PU characters, validating loadouts, and adding the ability to change the ship selection while in game. Here's the thing, okay? 
I absolutely understand the value of racing. I really do concern, I feel concerned sometimes. I know there's teams uh, like orgs that really play a lot of Arena Commander for for uh, practice and stuff. If Arena Commander isn't Arena Commander and Star Marine aren't a driving force behind feedback and changes to the game in the PU. Or they don't become like free to play versions that are like more marketing for Star Citizen. I don't get the point because I think most Star Citizen fans. have been kind of burned by these two, I guess, uh, game modes and don't aren't really interested in playing. Most. There are definitely some hardcore uh, community members who play Arena Commander, but almost nobody plays Star Marine. So it's going to be a lot of work to get these to where they need to be to be at a level in which anyone will play. But we'll see. Um, I just hope, because there's a lot of things, I talked about them yesterday, about like armor and weapons and attachments and ammo where Star Marine can really, really be a really good like kind of feedback tool to inform balance and changes and make the PU a lot more interesting in terms of items, right? And looting and all that stuff if they just tried things in Arena Commander. Um DJ says, as we get closer to the death of a spaceman, AC becomes more and more important. That should matter in the PU. AC will be a place to practice. We talk about it a little bit in today's ISC. Okay, and that's fair. I mean, that's why racing in Arena Commander makes so much sense to me. It's because death is a pain in the ass in, in the PU when racing. It's hard to get back there. So the practicing in of the tracks that you know in the PU is really important. It just comes down to, yes, but practice... There's got to be, it's got to be also a feedback loop for me. Otherwise, it's, it's a uh, practicing for what, you know, is kind of how I look at it. I just want to see, I want to see this game thrive. And uh, there's, there's some things we can do to, to really make it thrive. I think when it comes to the FPS, first off, it, it would definitely be the desync, but. After that, it's there's just items, man, and, and armor and so many cool changes we can make. It's just going to take some time. Now, moving on to features. This is always a big one. Character and weapons. Features. Uh, they continue to support an upcoming patch with critical bugs. Okay. Uh, player skills feature. Whoa. Who thought this was going to be this early? This tracks certain player activities and actions with minimal hooks into gameplay feature logic with an emphasis on performance. From the data and events gathered, players can improve certain aspects of their performance. For example, a player with a higher level of fitness may have more stamina or consume stamina at a lower rate. The team has been working on better support for player uh, playing animations triggered by environmental interactions, such as character physically opening a locker door or pressing buttons on a vehicle dashboard. These are either quick or de decorative action sequences with a larger focus on re reusability to scale with the amount of planned content. There's a lot of balancing to ensure it increases immersion with minimal impact on responsiveness. Okay. Gameplay features. Tractor beam is being worked on focusing on escaping mechanics. So this is vehicle tractor beam, such as how shields affect the required strength of a tractor beam to secure a ship. Very interesting. Very interesting. A prototype was built to test the potential and help decide whether average shield strength or per shield face determines the required strength. Additionally, the team began work on detaching and attaching items with the tractor beam, which is an expansion of the attaching to the cargo grid feature. Very cool. How cargo has informed other aspects of the game. Um, and what would you be attaching and detaching? You would be detaching weapons and ship components. Like, 
This is a ve this one paragraph is opening the door for very interesting piracy now and salvage mining bags yeah refineries right this is like it it doesn't mean they're going to do it anytime soon this is cig but this one feature is a big door opening uh, thing. I think well, we got the multi-tool tractor beam. It opened a lot of doors as well. Uh, clear direction for expected ship engineer gameplay was also defined. Uh, this involved determining the gameplay beats and planning the possible malfunctions dangerous players will face while maintaining their ships. Additionally, the ongoing mining balance update progressed well with small changes that have bigger impacts being added to the system. For s I wish we got more detail, man. Dang. Uh, for salvage gameplay features helped missions prepare to use the mechanic in new content. All right, mission team. Here we go. I want to hear more about these salvage missions. Uh, in the U.S., gameplay features continue on the over overall design for loading and unloading physicalized cargo and designs for missions that leverage the new cargo systems kicked off. These missions also utilize the boarding actions now available with Softest alongside the retrieval of containers or objects of interest. Guys, it's looking like... A lot of the things that I would like to see in the game are coming along. It's pretty cool. Investigation and prelim preliminary design work started on changes to ship insurance and how it works in conjunction with ship destruction. These changes are necessary to make towing and repairing, either at stations or in space, a better choice. Okay. Can we take a soft death ship and tow it and then repair it? Whoa. Whoa. Tasks were started for a change to commodities, including the locations they can be bought and sold from. For example, changes to mining locations will impact the location and prices for mined and refined ores at commodity brokers. Did Tony Z wake up? Is he woke? Wokeage? Tony Z? Uh oh. Here's the thing. I'm going to ask you guys, chat. Do we think these are 319 features? Me neither. So it's hard to get excited. Okay? That's the thing. Me neither. All right? It's tough. All right, mission features. Progress was also... Oh, wait. It's been addressing bugs. Okay, progress was also made designing and prototyping various new missions, including salvage. Here we go. Details. Uh, the order we are tackling these missions in is based on when we receive the necessary support. So this is a big thing for the mission team. I don't know if you guys know. It's it's a pain for them because they design missions, but they need support from like the entire company. So, <clears throat> excuse me, art, props, network, like all this stuff to make their stuff work. So, yeah. It's kind of why our missions suck is all these teams are doing their own thing and then mission team is like, hello, can I have some more, please? And then no, they, they just go, hey, get out of here, kid. Shut up. I'm working on other things that look pretty. Don't do things that are fun. And that's basically why we have what we have. Um, so the first missions produced will be the more simplistic salvage ones. These include a lawful contract in which players must pay for the location of salvage, an unlawful time mission in which players must strip a ship quickly or deal with inbound hostiles, and a lawless mission in which multiple players pay for a location of the same large salvage opportunity, and one in which players must restore a ship using nearby wrecks for materials. Okay, that's actually kind of cool. Pretty simple, but... Interesting. I like the lawless one. 
Uh, mining mission was also prototyped in which players purchase the location of a valuable prospect. There are currently three variants. Lawful, which takes place in a monitored zone and has friendly defenses to protect against hostiles. Uh, unlawful, where players seize legally owned mining claims. And lawless, which takes place in unmonitored zones and can be accepted by multiple players. Jump town, but make it mining. Jump town, but make it salvage. Kind of cool. Right? I'm down for that. You got the... And this is, again, this is kind of what your non-combat players are asking for. They don't... They probably don't realize it, but hey, we got these missions over here for you. And then we got these missions over here for you. And I just really hope that the lawless ones are significantly more valuable than the lawful ones. That's all, right? That's what we got to do for both salvage. And they did say the salvage one, if I believe. Um, yep, this is a large salvage opportunity. I would imagine the mining one is the same. Elliot's here. He works on the team. Um, I assume you can confirm that. It would be a more, uh, uh, it would just call it, kind of follow the same um, template as the salvage one that was explained, since it did in every other direction. Um, the team is also developing larger mission set on the Orison platforms. These tasks, these task players with either preventing the Ninetales gang from stealing Crusader Industries prototype parts or stealing them from another criminal organization. Okay. It'd be more profitable, but risky. Perfect. So that that's confirmed by Elliot of the mission team there. Um, just that it was following the same template as salvage. I just wanted to double check because it wasn't written there. Um, a few other missions progressed through design work on Bounty Hunting V2, and the mission manager update continued. Uh, again, this little paragraph here may not seem like a lot, but it will, I think, really open some big doors for uh, interactions between players and hopefully interactions with a much better Moby Glass mission manager than what we have now. I think it's very confusing for new players. And uh, that is definitely, this has to be a huge quality of life fix and not just a transfer over into building blocks. Finally, for mission features, designers, uh, designs for defending player ships from intruders and ship-based hostility were worked on. Okay, I mean, we have 890 jump. So it's sort of like that, but probably better. These features are intended to replace simplistic hostility in uh, currently in-game, where ships remember the hostility of their last pilot or turn hostile the moment a hostile player steps aboard. Very cool. Um, this is uh, one of the largest mission write-ups we've seen in a while, and just so many things happening. It's not just a big write-up on the one feature they're working on. And and let's not ignore that, um, again, Elliot and Chad is probably still working on those uh, investigation missions. So these are all being worked on by other people and and other things. Like, their team is getting big, and we need it to. In-game branding. Uh, worked on the Lorville skyline, and then they transitioned to Invictus launch week. Oh, disgusting. Absolutely fucking disgusting. I don't know what to say here. This team was made for what? Does anybody remember what this team was made for? It was to make the new player experience better. What happened? Then it turned into marketing. Disgusting. I hope you guys recognize how excited I am for these, but how easy it is to say, what is this garbage? The new player experience is done? Where? Where is it? Lighting, we just skip. Live tools. Uh, entity graph, network. Yeah, this is all going to be server meshing stuff. Uh, EU locations. Pyro's Ruin Station. All right, so this is a big one. I feel like we've seen a lot of Ruin Station, but I guess not. 
This being a task uh, that the team have been diligently working on, it's looking, and it's looking better day on day. Elocation 2 progressed with the local office mentioned in the last month, month's report and created new content alongside missing features. Sandbox teams further de developed the Colonial Outpost and continued exploration on, and development of the underground facilities. Okay, so that's like an airlock. Production is starting to ramp up, and the team are feeling good about the work being done. Organic's team spent the month reworking areas already in the game and progressed the art benchmark for Rocky Caves. Uh, narrative, which is turned into one of the things you want to read. Uh, they start working with design teams, start scripting upcoming mining and salvage mission content. They also get to do developing the stories of the first batch of investigation missions. There you go. Uh, the environment and design teams provided updates on new locations that will start appearing in the game to support bounty hunting, uh, which is the bounty office. I think we, we heard about that, right? Planning was also undertaken for the year ahead. Um, building a comprehensive resource list of the various organizations and NPCs and what mission content they offer. This provides a single source for the team members to reference when coming up with new missions. Okay. And then again, they scaled back the fiction com uh, content to be able to do more stuff like that. Um, and now our missions and in-game stuff should be more lore in them, which will be really good. In Montreal... The goal was to achieve technical design consensus, blah, 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 blah. online services, server meshing tier zero. Uh, the remainder of the month was spent putting the final touches on Alpha 318 features. Okay. Ship tech art and animation. Hull C is mentioned here. Tech animation damage support was provided for several ships in the pipeline. They also enabled shader damage scraping on various ship attachments and fixed several hull scraping issues on ship bodies. Okay. UI. Squadron 42 star map. They don't even call it the PU star map, which will eventually make its way into the PU. The current focus is adding navigation aids such as grids and coordinates, improving the size of planets and markers, and adding visual polish. VFX. Carried out several CPU to GPU particle library conversions, starting with vehicles. The sheer number of existing libraries combined with the content being added all the time means it can be sometimes tricky for the team to revisit and update all their libraries. We're getting there, though. Elsewhere, pre-production began on some new locations, uh, including a huge underground facility and rocky caves. Team also continued with the snag list mentioned in last month. Okay. So that was the monthly report. And I'm telling you, that was a pretty good one uh, for me. That that is a big one for me. That's something where I mining missions. Yeah. Now when somebody says to a miner, you should bring people to protect you, now there's a point. Now there's a point to it. Very exciting. Same with salvage now. It's it's like the game is making sense, and now the player is accepting the risk when they accept certain missions. The risk versus reward is being added more and more to the game, and it's like signing a contract that I may be PvP'd. Will players still get mad? Will they spam their keyboards on Spectrum? Uh, and anytime they, you know, somebody is pro-PvP, will they card palm? Yes, because that's our community. But in the end, uh, every time I read through these things, I feel better about the game that's being built and just a little worse about the community that's playing it. <laughs> but that's it. So thank you very much, everybody, for watching this one. That was pretty fun. I'm so excited.